Let's just all say it together because then it's out there and we will feel better deep down in our tum tums. And I believe this will be a very therapeutic exercise. So put your hands in the air like this for no reason whatsoever. I just thought it would be fun. And like I say, all together, WWE Raw. And the moment is just a pretty bad show. And stop saying all this nonsense like it's a WWE problem. No, it's not. Smackdown is a ball of wonderfulness that hits me in the face. Whereas Raw every single week is just so damn confusing. But we are about to get into it, and we're gonna get the good bits up, and we're gonna get the bad bits down. But before we do get there, head over to the community tab and vote in this week's Retro Ups and Downs poll. And the shows that you would like to see are WrestleMania 8, SummerSlam 1992 with Mr. Hitman, Bad Blood 1997, the debut of Kane, and Raw 1000. But we will get to that later in the week, and for now, my name is Simon Miller, we're gonna watch Culture Wrestling, and let's up those downs for Monday Night Raw. Raw started with a match. I know, I know, do not reset your clocks and do not look at your calendars. I couldn't believe it either and it made me feel so excited. Like, oh, maybe we're about to get some fresh print. And then just as we were this close, out came AJ Styles and Omos. Well, you see, it was meant to be a tag team battle royal to determine the number one contenders, but for some reason, and I really like AJ Styles, he had to go on for ages and forever, just talking and talking, and no word of a lie, he didn't say anything of note. He was just going through all the teams going, well, I hate you, and I hate you, and you're kind of okay. Oh, take my mind, I hate you. There was also some stupid stuff in here in the sense that Lince Dorado was in the ring by himself because Grandmother Metalik had been injured. So I was like, well, why the hell are they in a tag team battle royal to begin with? And we also had RK Bro, The New Day, Mason T-Bar, and the Viking Raiders. When AJ was done talking, then Riddle started talking and started making some jokes about the fact that Randy Orton doesn't wear shirts. And then the New Day was talking. And when I finally thought I was about to hear ding, 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 out oh, came the Miz and John Morrison and they started talking. The whole thing then got even more moronic because John Morrison was like, well, the Miz is injured. So I'm just going to enter myself into this tag team battle royal by myself. Why didn't he team up with Lince Dorado? And we actually got the highlight of Raw after this because John Morrison then did his slow-mo entrance, and because The Miz is injured, and because The Miz is in a wheelchair, Johnny Drip Drip let go of this wheelchair too early, so you saw The Miz rolling towards the squared circle in slow motion. That really made me chuckle. Even after that though, we couldn't start the thing because RK Bro started hitting everybody with RKOs, and honestly, it must have taken 20 minutes from the insinuation that we were gonna have a wrestling fight to this wrestling fight actually starting. This was probably even more stretched out than your normal raw long opening promo. For that reason alone, it's got to get it down. It was clear that Riddle and Orton weren't going to win this either because it was an over the top rope elimination match. So what better way to protect them? But I never would have called who did come out the victors because it was the Viking Raiders. Now it's not their fault, but ever since they have come back, they have done the grand total of nothing. So when they were declared the number one contenders, I kind of scratched my head like, well, shouldn't they have won a match or done something? But apparently the answer to that is no. Morrison and Dorado were also out really early, so that whole twist was an utter waste of time. And the real joy of this is that Riddle and Randy Orton are slowly starting to work better as a team. You can see their chemistry and you can see their relationship blossoming in front of your eyeballs. It took everybody to eliminate Mason T-Bar because you were supposed to go, well, they're some kind of a force, but they're not. And if it wasn't for Riddle taking his eye off the prize, maybe he would have stayed in the ring, but he didn't and he got chucked over the top rope too. That was courtesy of the New Day and the Vikings, but it annoyed Matt so much he got back into the ring, because there are no rules in the Battle Royal, and he kind of got involved, but to cut a long story short, the Viking Raiders then grabbed Randy Orton, they threw him over the top rope, and yes, like I've already said around about four times, they are now going to take on AJ Styles and Omos, at some point in the future. This was fine though, all things considered. I mean, I wouldn't go out of your way to watch it, but when talking about the finger of power, we'll just give it an up. I think one of the reasons I did like it is that we were focusing on the tag team division, which was kind of what we did afterwards too, because we cut to the back and there was Charlotte Flair. And of course she was yelling at Sonya Deville and she was yelling at Adam Pearce saying, I want my loss last week to Nikki Cross to be stricken from the record. When Rhea Ripley also walked in and said, yeah, that sounds like a good plan, mate. Can I have mine stricken from the record too? Because they both wanted to have a rematch against Cross as well, Adam Pearce and Sonya then just went, well, we've got a great idea. Why don't you team up instead and take on Nikki Cross 
and a partner of her choosing. And so I swear that Raw is officially just out of ideas because you already know why WWE did this. So the commentators the whole time could go, well, how are they going to coexist as a tag team? Which is the most overdone story maybe in the history of all of sports entertainment. We then had some fallout with the Viking Raiders too. They were so excited that they are the number one contenders. They were going to go away and eat a turkey leg. And then AJ Styles and Omos turned up. I think Omos ate some of the turkey leg. And AJ basically thought, well, I don't think you're real Vikings. Once more, you could have taken this off of Raw and nothing would have been different. I honestly then think that we have turned Jackson Riker into a good guy. Because Elias is in the ring saying he did what he did do last week because his former friend may be a warrior, but he never battled on behalf of Elias. When Jackson did turn up with a brand new haircut that kind of makes him look like Zack Ryder and Christian pushed together, and he started to beat up the instrumental dude until the referee stopped him and they broke it up. If you looked at the Thunderdome screens though, you could see a bunch of people going, yeah, yeah, you go Jackson Riker. And do not forget, they are being produced. So somebody was telling them, cheer for this man, but what the hell has he done? to elicit any kind of a cheers. I mean, the break of this team only happened within five minutes, and now seven days on, we're meant to feel emotions for this man. I say no. Unless you are Jackson Riker's mother, then hell yeah, man, you go crazy. This was so just there as well, it basically existed. I can't give it an up or a down, and the story actually would have been better if it turned out that Jackson Riker was the first commander on the Starship Enterprise, and he was hanging out with Captain Picard. I know that's a stupid joke that I make just because they have kind of a same name, but everybody loved that Riker, and I don't think anybody has gotten behind this Riker as of yet. At this time as well, I was thinking, well, I guess we're going to save this match for the pay-per-view, but no, we just did it, and it ended with a countout down. Because Elias just left after a few minutes. Yeah, he was getting beaten up and decided, well, I'm not really enjoying this, so he got out of the ring, the referee counted to 10, this was all done in three minutes, and they are three minutes that I'm never ever getting back. We had a contract signing next, because of course we did. WWE has somewhat of a big match around the corner, so they just do a contract signing. I bet they're all in the writer's room, and Vince McMahon just went, we should do a contract signing, damn it, but something more interesting. Then he left, and all the writers went, Everybody all right with the contract signing? So we just did it. Drew McIntyre was out first as well, and given that Bobby Lashley didn't turn up, he told us this very nice story about a Scottish king, with the moral of the piece being, you should never give up. Now look, I like Drew McIntyre, but surely at Hell in a Cell, this has to be the last match between him and Bobby Lashley. Just starting to wear a little bit thin. MVP and Lashley eventually did turn up, they just wanted to be fashionably late, and they want to add a stipulation to the deal, which is if Drew does lose at the pay-per-view, he is never allowed to come after Bobby Lashley's world championship again. And while I thought that was a nice idea, I was a bit like, Bob, why didn't you talk to Adam Pearce and Sonya Deville before Monday night? Now they got to amend the contract. This is doubly true because Drew then shot back, yep, I'm all happy with this, but I've got another stipulation I want to make. And of course, because we have a pay-per-view called Hell in a Cell, we have to put people in the Hell in a Cell. So now Bob versus Drew is going to be in the structure of death. He's always come across weak these days too, because we are just retroactively fitting this stipulation into a storyline. But of course, they both think they're going to win. And there was this really weird part where they finished showering each other and Bobby Lashley just said something. He was like, but I'm gonna beat you there. And it didn't tie into the conversation at all. It'd be like me coming up to you going, hey man, how's it going? And you just respond by going, fish breath. Be like, I don't wanna talk to you no more. I'm gonna assume that McIntyre does lose though, because I've got it in my head that at SummerSlam, we're gonna do Bobby Lashley versus Brock Lesnar. But just to show that he is super duper serious, he got his sword and he cut the contract signing table in half. And everyone was like, oh man, Drew McIntyre's gone crazy. I guess this was all okay. Up. We then found out that Oscar is going to be Nikki Cross's partner. And let's make it very clear, Oscar is one of the best wrestlers in the world. But this women's division is just going to be stuck on loop until the end of time. I mean, thank goodness we did push Nikki Cross into it, because that's made it feel a little bit different. But otherwise, flub me sideways. I really wanted to give it up for what happened next too. And you know what? I am for the match between Humberto Carrillo and Ricochet because they went out there and they made the most of their minutes. They maximized them. So for the effort alone up, they were being watched on by Seamus too, who was in a really bad mood because he has legitimately broken his nose. So he wanted to rant and rave about it. Then Humberto and Ricochet pretended they were gonna dive on him. And the Irishman was like, no, don't do it. And honestly, a little part of me was like, well, now I feel sorry for Seamus 
and I kind of feel like these two dudes are being a bunch of jackasses and that was not the point. The winner of this as well was meant to become the number one contender. So do you know how we finished it? That's right, with a double count out. So if you are keeping score, we didn't do any distractions on this episode of Raw, but what we did do was just a bunch of count outs. Down. Ricochet gave Carrillo a Spanish fly to the outside and they hit so hard, neither guy could get back in the ring in time. But yeah, how on earth can you have a script for Raw and it says in the match prior, we'll do a count out and in the match following, we will do a count out. I mean, that's like I slap myself and go, oh, that hurts. And they go, oh, I'll do it again. I'm still in the exact same place that I was. Seamus laughed at all of this and then just walked off. And I realized in this moment that we are going to get to the year 2034 and we are still going to be doing the same stuff. And then from nowhere, we had this awesome segment between MVP and Kofi Kingston. So whoever wrote this, you need to start writing all of Raw is getting up. Because MVP told Kofi that he was so inspired by Kofi Mania, it was the reason he wanted to come back to the WWE. But as ever, Kingston always drops the ball like he did last week when he was taken on Drew McIntyre. You see this edge, this different side to him, but then he has to be the happy, happy positivity dude. And that's why he's not achieving any success. Kingston then fired up and talked about how that none of that was true. And he does this for his family. He does this for his friends. And he does for the kids that can look up to him and think, oh man, maybe I can do that one day as well because he's all about representation. And when we were done here, all I could think was, why aren't we doing Kofi versus Bobby Lashley at the Hell in a Cell? I really want to see it. Kingston also thinks that Bobby Lashley is only doing this for the money. The MVP was like, nah, man, that's not the case at all. He does it for legacy and he does it for prestige. So I have no idea where this is going, but it got me really intrigued. And please, for the love of everything, don't just drop this WWE like you do drop every single other story. It's got my eyebrow raised and I want to see where it's going to go. It was then backstage fun time on Monday Night Raw because we had another video with Eve Marie. And thankfully, she is going to debut next week because these have been going on to well too long. And we had another chat between Mansoor and Mustafa Ali. That was a tick straight away. I genuinely thought WWE was never going to mention it again. But Mansoor was warming up when Mustafa went up to him and asked if he was ready for his match against Drew Gulak. And when Mansoor said yes, Mustafa was like, but are you really though? Because this is Drew Gulak we're talking about. He's probably got some kind of underhanded plan. So maybe you need to start thinking outside the box. This pairing is actually really good though. So once more, I sit quietly and I just hope that in a few weeks, we have actually progressed the story. And then stuff literally just happened because it was Jeff Hardy versus Cedric Alexander. Now we did get a promo beforehand when Jeff was all like, hey man, Cedric Alexander, you just been running around the place. You're so arrogant and that's not how it works. And I was like, well, that's kind of true, but it's also not true at all. And also, where has Jeff Hardy been? If you only watch Raw, he has vanished and then appeared from the abyss. Nobody bothers to tell me why. It also leaves us another stupid situation because I'm gonna give the match it up because they work really well together, but the finish gets it down because after Cedric had decided, oh, I'm gonna pretend to be Jeff Hardy and went and did his taunt on the top rope, it allowed Jeff to get back to his feet. He hit the Swanton Bomb, he hit the Twist of Fate, but the other way around, and he just pinned him. So where was Shelton Benjamin? Why were these two even fighting? And what the hell do you do now? Cedric Alexander didn't lose under conspicuous means. He just lost, so surely this is done, and we move on to something else. But you just know that's not gonna be the case. More chat between Charlotte and Rhea Ripley next, and I'm not gonna lie, we didn't need another segment like this, especially because the way they were standing and the way they were shot was kind of like they were partaking in some form of amateur dramatics. The whole point of it though is that Rhea wants to be the leader and obviously Charlotte wants to be the leader. So now no one's gonna be the leader and I just knew they were gonna beat the crap out of each other in their tag team match, which is exactly what happened. Because this match was next and they were just thumping each other in the face but pretending it was tags. I mean, there was blind tags, there were chops. Oscar and Nikki Cross basically didn't exist here. They just faded into the background. And it was all about the fact that Charlotte and the women's champion hated each other's guts. There was this really silly bit where Charlotte had Nikki Cross on her shoulders and just ran into her corner and knocked Rhea Ripley off the apron. But Rhea wasn't in the right position, so she had to walk to the turnbuckle and then get knocked off. And the long and the short of it is that Charlotte got so mad towards the end, she just gave Rhea Ripley the natural selection and that allowed Nikki Cross to pin her. It was kind of cool because Oscar and Nikki Cross danced around the announce table like, yeah, we're the winners. But were they? Were they really? I would say 
not. This was all right though, and while the story isn't really to my taste personally, I also have no idea whether I meant to cheer or boo Rhea Ripley, we did carry this on. It was easy to watch, so I'm gonna give it an up. I'm not massively that excited about their match at the pay per view. Mansoor then defeated Drew Gulak. Two minutes. It also ended with the most devastating move in all of sports entertainment, but actually fair play to WWE because at least they tied it into the narrative. Because Drew Gulak did it at first, but he held the tights and Mansoor remembering what Mustafa Ali had told him, he reversed it and he also held the tights, so he did get a victory, but maybe now his brain is being corrupted. So at least this was something. I mean, they deserved a lot more time. You could barely get into this, but I will put myself out there and I will give it an up, but I swear WWE. If this then vanishes from existence, much like Jeff Hardy on Raw, I am going to be a very upset and a very bored man. Randy Orton was then backstage and he magically unlocked Riddle's mouth with a fictional key. But Riddle then started talking about Burger King, so Randy Orton then magically re-locked his mouth and he threw away the key into the trash. This actually happened, so I can only presume that Riddle is now Randy Orton's child. This then led into Riddle taking on Kofi Kingston, and this was another good part of Raw. And really, Kofi Kingston stole the show on this night. He did that awesome promo, then he was great here too. I'm giving it an up. Xavier Woods kept playing the trombone to distract Riddle, but this tied into the overarching story, because beforehand, Riddle would be like, hey Randy, are you gonna come to the ring with me? And Randy's like, well, I don't really think I want to. But because he is starting to warm towards Riddle, he did come out here to even the odds, and even grabbed Xavier Woods and chucked him into the announce table. Kofi was also using all of this to just throw himself into both guys, which is always a fun spot to watch. And Riddle back in the ring was using all of Randy Orton's moves. Not only did he do the draping DDT, but he was gonna go for the RKO. And unfortunately that didn't go to plan, so instead he went for the bro Derek. But it's actually him going for his own maneuvers which caused him to fail, because Kofi begins to reverse that, he hit the trouble in paradise, and like I say, what an evening for Kofi, he got the win. So I really enjoyed this, and you've got to imagine that at the Hell in a Cell pay-per-view, we do New Day versus RK Bro, and then RK Bro win, and then they head to SummerSlam to become the tag team champions, and all of that is nice and simple, and all of it is something that I can just enjoy. One thing I do have to point out though, is what the hell is going going on with Raw. We only have like 10 people and we just recycle them from match to match to match because we'd already seen Riddle, we'd already seen Orton and we'd already seen The New Day and then they were back out here for another match. Why can't we just put more people onto the flubbing show? Down. If you can believe it then too, our main event segment was actually going to be everything between Alexa Bliss and Shayna Baszler. So let's all prepare ourselves because you ain't gonna believe it. Nia Jax wanted to talk to Shayna beforehand and was all like, Shayna, don't go out there. You don't know what Alexa Bliss is capable of. And I was like, well, what is she capable of, really? She hasn't tried to murder anybody. Up to this point, she just had fire come out of ring posts. So essentially, she's just Ken and Ryu from Street Fighter 2. It was all set in the ring as well. And basically, Alexa told Shayna, you've got to apologize to Lily, even though she's a doll. Because Shayna Baszler is a former MMA fighter, she's like, I'm not going to apologize to a toy. That sounds like the stupidest thing I've ever heard. I was like, you tell me, Shayna, you tell me. Lily then said something which got Alexa super mad. And when Shayna still wouldn't take this seriously, Bliss jumped Shayna Baszler, but thankfully she did away with her and got her hands on the doll. She threw it on the floor and she stamped on it. And this was meant to be a really big deal. And I just went, meh. Apparently though, it is the worst thing she could have done because all of a sudden the lights started to flicker, fire started to come up from the rampway and all the screens went dark. And Shayna Baszler was so scared, even though she'd been saying she wasn't gonna be scared, she started to run away. The Thunderdome was kind of falling apart at this stage too. So Shayna Baszler was terrified and she tried to find a room she could hide herself in. <laughs> And when she did find one very handily, there was a cameraman just waiting. She then started to stare at a mirror and in the mirror she could see Lily. But when she turned around, Lily wasn't going to be there and this was too much for her brain to handle. So she smashed this mirror, but within all the cracks, you could still see that Lily was there. And I was like, oh my God, it's so terrifying even though it actually wasn't at all. But wrestling needs to learn that all mirrors are bad ideas. We did it with Warrior and Hogan in WCW and it didn't make any sense. I remember all that stuff that Mojo Rawley was doing when he was shouting into a broken mirror, you never get where you wanna go. The last thing we heard as Raw went off air too was Shayna Baszler just screaming, ah! 
her. And fair play to her. She did the best with this as she possibly could. But what am I meant to think here? That there's a demonic doll in WWE that's just roaming around, stalking people? I'm sorry, I cannot emotionally invest into that because it's really, really dumb. And as I always say, if you're loving this and it's making you feel all excited right down in your tootsies, then hell yeah, man, I'm all for it. But it is going right over my head, which I accept is not a very hard thing to do, and it's getting it down. Also, who gets scared about a doll? It's just a doll. What the flub is going on? <laughs> what the hell? That's not real. I was controlling the doll. My hand was up his ass. That does bring us to another episode of Monday Night Raw, and I suppose if we're trying to be positive, fair play to WWE trying something different to end the show. But again, it wasn't for me, and the rest of the show was yet another repeat, and we did just push Jeff Hardy in there. But I did not enjoy it, <laughs> therefore, it has to get it down. Now don't forget to leave a comment below and let us know what you thought about last night's episode of Raw. Like the video, share the video, and subscribe. Head over to whatculture.com where you can read a bunch of articles about professional wrestling. Come say hello on social media. Why don't you go give another video a click and just watch wrestling videos for the entire day. My name is Simon for What Culture. Thank you for joining me as always, and I will see you throughout the week.